So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Andrei Marusov. I'm a correspondent of Kyiv Post and we are now in the studio of Kyiv Post. And my guest is uh, John Sweeney, uh, the renowned British uh, investigative journalist uh, who spent dozens of years investigating and uh, covering the war conflicts, uh, specifically uh, the war and the regime of Vladimir Putin back in Russia. Uh, recently, he completed uh, the documentary uh, called Eastern Front uh, about Russian aggression uh, into Ukraine. And uh, so we will talk about Eastern Front and other topics uh, related to it. Uh, so perhaps my first question is uh, uh, how this Eastern Front was uh, conceived, uh, what has been its focus? and how it's been made. Where did you go? What did you do? Uh, and uh, when we will be able to, to watch it? Well, you can watch it now. The reason we made it um, is very simple. Is there are people in the West with power and money and influence who are telling lies about this war. And they are buying into the Russian dark fairy story that Russia has some way uh, been aggrieved and that Russia is fighting this war uh, in a proper way. Now, those are lies. And we wanted to tell, uh, to make a film which told specifically Western audiences what's really happening here. Ukrainians, I want lots of Ukrainians to watch it, obviously. Um, and we're having a premiere here on June the 7th. But Ukrainians already know the truth. Of course they do. I mean, like this morning, um, what, 10 o'clock, I was just finishing breakfast, when you hear seven massive explosions in Kyiv, and the Russians had sent, I think, hypersonic missiles? No, yeah, yeah. Sounds like that. Something like this, yeah. to kill us. And Ukrainian air defense, the Patriot system, knocks these things out of the sky. There's one awful piece of footage of of uh, a, uh, a rocket coming down on a car. It just missed a, a bus by two seconds. So, but what, what I find incredibly infuriating is the people, um, the Trump supporters, Trump himself, Tucker Carlson, who believe that, that this war isn't happening. Hmm. But what we did in the film is we, it starts in Dnipro, and Dnipro is a beautiful city on the river, and the Russians put a big cruise missile into an ordinary working class block of flats, big block of flats, like 10 stories high, and they killed 50 people, six kids, and we went to a playground, we were just talking to people, and we met two mums, and one of the mums she had, was filming her own kids when the rocket comes. Now, they're OK, but you can see the horrific moment it lands. And then up on the, um, on the block, there's, um, there's somebody got a beautiful yellow kitchen. And the people who had the yellow kitchen, they, they did a video. There's a little girl, it's her birthday. And there's her dad, uh, and smiling as the little girl blows out uh, candles on the cake and a couple of days later he's dead killed in this bloody thing now this isn't a military target it's a yeah. block of flats and so this is just one example of the Russian army's use of terror against civilians in a pitiless and unbelievably cruel way and if you think this is somehow unusual for the Russians, then you haven't been paying attention. I first called Vladimir Putin a war criminal 23 years ago when I went undercover to Chechnya twice and I saw evidence of the Russian army bombing a civilian convoy, a white flag convoy, killing maybe 200, and 200 300 people. And then, I, um, um, then you follow what happens in Syria, and then, the, um, and then 
both the first and the second wars here, but certainly in terms of the, the big war here, what happened to Mariupol, or Bucha, or Borodanka, or Erpin. There is destruction of civilian targets again and again and again, war crime after war crime after war crime. There is some strange alchemy about the film, which is interesting, and it's this, is that Kalen Robertson, the director who's shooting it, had never been to a war zone before. And uh, he did, went on the combat um, um, awareness course where you, you learn combat medicine, which is very, very important, and also some awareness of the battlefield. Um, taught by my friend Paul Conroy, who's a great guy who's here in Keith now. And, but Kalen kind of, you know, he attended the course, but it, it's tricky. When you hear, bang, you know, he would jump like a mile. And it was Ukrainian artillery outgoing. Mm -hmm. And neither Paul and I, I mean, we've listened to this nonsense a lot. So Paul and I just don't move. And I explained, that's outgoing. And then there's another bang, and kind of jumps, and the camera jumps, because he's scared. Mm. I said, that's outgoing. And the, there's a simple sound, and out it goes. That's OK. Incoming, it's a longer sound, because you hear first the um, the bang as it goes out the gun and the bang when it arrives or something like this. And you can feel it through your feet some of the time. Mm. Um, so it's quite different. And, uh, and Kevin doesn't quite trust me or believe me. And so he turns the camera on Paul and Paul goes, correct. Absolutely correct. <laughs> so there's a, because, but what's interesting is that when I say, well, we've got to go, when we were in Hassan, I meant it. We've got to go because of, because uh, the odds of us staying in a, in a place where they're hitting the artillery, the longer you stay, the higher the odds of you getting killed. Mm. That's a fact. What we do then is we go to Hassan and we follow a story of white phosphorus, white phosphorus and this stuff. Um, which the Russians are using, and uh, it has a military purpose, but the Russians are using it against civilian targets again and again and again. War crime after war crime after war crime. And we, there's a video taken of this stuff landing in Kherson, and we go to the house where the two houses were burnt down, and we find a, um, um, the, the white phosphorus cartridges, which had, mm -hmm. uh, um, um, which had landed. And we talked to civilians who witnessed it, who, who tried to put fires out. So we, I think we nail um, absolutely the fact that the Russian army is using white phosphorus against civilians, and that is against the rules of war. The reason why Ukrainians want to liberate every inch of Ukraine is they know what the Russians do to people if they've got territory. And what they do to people is they rape them and they castrate them and they torture them. Did you have a chance to, to, to talk and to, <clears throat> uh, to show like, people in the, in the Eastern Front of those who were tortured by, by Russians? Yeah, so we interview in her song. Mm. Um, we go to, we do, we do three things. The first of us, we, we, we meet a guy on the street who's been tortured, and he tells us what happens. And at one point, he, you can see him tearing up because he, the memories are giving him flashbacks. Then we go to a police station, um, which had been used as someone to torture, and we come across a, uh, a guy called Alexander, and he, it's his first time back since he was tortured there. And you can absolutely, you're absolutely part of Cam Cameron's camera work, but um, Alexander is a big man, and he's strong physically and mentally. And yet he breaks down and starts to cry because of the emotional impact of going back. And then we go to a third place, um, which is um, it's the old cells underneath the, um, the kind of Stalin era police station. Mm. And these cells are so awful that when Ukraine became independent, Ukrainians um, closed them, didn't use them, and built a new police station elsewhere. 
when the Russians take over, they open up the old cells and they put their high value uh, prisoners in there. And it's, you know, like it's dank and dark and grim. And it hasn't been used since, the, what, 91? So it hasn't mm. been used for something like 30 years. There's 30 years of kind of yuck. And it just felt so grim. And there was, we didn't meet any prisoners in there, but they'd been there. And the, and the Ukrainian soldiers who were showing us, uh, uh, they were, um, um, they had, they knew people had been in there. Remember, by the way, the Russian army is about a thousand yards away from the center of Kherson. Mm. It's just on the other side of the river. So the whole time, you know, where, um, when you move, when you drive like crazy, when you go downstairs, you run downstairs. And every now and then, bang, you know, um, cannon jumps, we just go, yeah. Um, but um, down in the basement, I found a, a slum. Um, you know what that means, elephant. Oh. So this is a gas mask. And essentially uh, what happens is, and I first came across this in Chechnya, is your, your hands are tied behind your back, handcuffed, and they put the gas mask on you. And uh, the reason they call it the slum of the elephant is that the, uh, the Soviet era gas mask has a corrugated nozzle or trunk. Oh. And you unscrew, they unscrew the filter. And in Chechnya, what they did was they would squirt CS gas up the nozzle and people would start to drown in their own tears and snot and get the yeah. helpless. Now, what they, I don't know what they did in her song, but when I went to this underneath, you know, the, the cells underneath the police station and I saw the gas masks with the filter taken off, I thought, oh, they're doing yeah, this again. And separately, my fixer had been, worked on another story in Izium which is in another part of the country, yeah, over Kharkiv. to the east. Mm. Um, but there, they had used the elephant on people. And what you can do, the simple, rather than the CS gas, which is a super sophisticated cruelty, you just, you can choke the, um, the nozzle, um, the trunk, if you like, and if you grip it, then the person start, can't breathe. Mm. Or you can pour water down it, so it's a kind of waterboarding. Mm. Um, and they used that fucking thing. And I first came across it 23 years ago in Chechnya when I made a radio documentary for the BBC and nothing has changed. So what's very important for people who think, oh, the Ukrainians should cut a deal, people like Trump, okay, who I've met three times. The last time I met him, I challenged him about his relationship with a Russian-born gangster, Felix Sasa and Trump. Mm. walked away from me. He didn't like my question. But the Russian occupiers use torture as a standard practice. It's industrial. They use it again and again and again. And I've been, not for this film, but I've interviewed people in, um, tortured in Kupiansk police station in the far east of the country. Her song is pretty much um, oh, it's, a, it's in the south, and again and again and again, torture, torture, torture. So, so Trump, you, if you say to the Ukrainians, give up some land, give it to the Russians, and everything will be hunky-dory, then he's living in a dark fantasy world because the reality is that people under Russian occupation will be raped and castrated and tortured, and tortured wholesale. So that's why we made the film. We want people to see it, as many as possible. And we meet an old guy in Siversk who is, he's got the shakes, he's, there's something medically wrong with him, but he's looking after his animals. And he can't, he doesn't have enough money to take his, an, move his animals. And so he is trapped by his love for his animals in a place where he could die at any second. And then I think the most moving thing is, in the whole movie, is that there is a lovely lady in Severski, and she talks about the trees. 
and the trees are beautiful in high summer because they protect people from the, the heat of the sun. And she's ashamed of what's happened because there's no power, there's no electricity, the Russians have cut it. And so what they've done is, because they're all old and if you go out, you may die because of the artillery. So you have to go and get wood from the closest possible place. And that means she and her friends and neighbors have cut down the trees in, um, in the little courtyard of their mm. ordinary working class block of flats. And she's sad that she has cut down the trees. But to make it good, she's planted little seedli seedlings in the ground for the future, for her grandkids. And there is something so beautiful about that moment, it actually kind of makes me cry even to think about it. Because that's the truth about Ukraine, is that they are fighting for a better future. And Russia is fighting for a darker past. Yeah. <clears throat> By the way, about this like future, uh I mean, here in Ukraine, I mean, many people understand that, okay, after, after the victory, we will still have this neighbor, uh, Russia. And uh, the question is, uh, okay, what should be done uh, in order to stop Russia being the constant threat to its neighbors and to the whole world? I mean, it's kind we, of... We have to be tough. Um, when the, I'm, I'm optimistic um, but the Russian army will be defeated by the Ukrainian army. Um, I'm, I'm very optimistic about that. Maybe next year, perhaps even this year. And then I think Putin's in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, Putin leaves the Kremlin in a box. I would, he might have an accident. If I was him, I wouldn't go near any windows. I wouldn't drink any tea. It, um, it, because I think power and money in Moscow doesn't like it when their czar fails, in particular in a war. And Putin has, has failed in this war. But then we've got to say whoever follows Putin, and there will be a period of chaos, of course there will be, because Putin's system is to prevent peaceful change. The reason why democracy is so beautiful is that democracy allows for proper political change um, in a civilized way. Mm. Putin, Putin's entire shtick is to prevent that. So of course when he falls there will be some degree of chaos. But the way to look at this is you, you cannot let the Russians get away with what they're doing. So the, the chaos after Putin will be worrying. But at the same time that is Putin. That is Putin's legacy. And the problem that we have in the West is that we kept on letting Vladimir Putin get away with murder for far too long. Mm. Again, again, and again, he murdered people. Um, in Britain, for example, Litvinenko. He tried to murder oh, Skripal, yeah. and he murdered somebody completely different. But never mind, they were British. And each time, what we did was we, we expelled Russian diplomats. What? All that means is that Putin has to print some more Diplomatic passports. He doesn't give a fuck about that. Mm. We should have hit him hard financially. So what I believe for the future is that we should say to the Russians, you've got to elect somebody who's going to be like Willy Brandt, who after the Nazis, some years after the Nazis, but he went to the Warsaw Ghetto and he got down on his knees yeah. to sig symbolize that Germany that a new Germany had arrived and it was sorry for what it had done. And it was going to pay in some way to make good at least the physical damage. So Russia has to do two things, it has to do three things. It has to elect a leader who puts Russia back on the road towards democracy. Mm. It has to say, we are sorry. And it has to pay Ukraine a lot of money. And the fourth thing, there needs to be war crimes trials. 
The people who sent these rockets today to this city, they should be tried. The generals who planned it, the pilots who, um, who flew the bombers, the rocket engineers back at the base, all of these people are war criminals and they should be tried. The rapists and the Russian soldiers who've castrated Ukrainian soldiers, those are war crimes and they should be tried for it. I've written an, another book as well as Killing the Kremlin, which is coming out on July 20th. It's about Aidan Aslim. Mm. And Aidan was a British guy, Nottinghamshire. The book's called Putin's Prisoner. And he was, he was captured by the Russians. And the moment he, they saw his passport, they hit him on the nose. Then he was handed over to the Ukrainian traitors in the Donetsk People's Republic, which is yeah, a yeah. Mickey Mouse state. And they tortured him. They beat him up so badly he lost conscious. And they stabbed him. And then later on in his captivity, he was taken to a prison where he was made to run the court. They put, you put a hood on and then they hit you. And he doesn't know where he's going because he can't see. Mm. Sometimes you have to go downstairs. Terrifying. I did this to one of his cellmates or a fellow prisoner. And they killed him. They killed him in the cell. And Aidan doesn't know this man's name. I think the person who killed that guy is a war criminal and he should be tried. Graham Phillips turns up. He's a propagandist for the Russians. Yeah, yeah. He's, a, he's a Brit. Um, Elliot Higgins uh, from Bellingcat says, He's been sanctioned. He shouldn't be sanctioned. He, be, he should be sectioned, i.e. he's mentally ill. <laughs> but he, he is mentally ill, perhaps, but he is also doing great harm. And what he did was he piled on, on top of the physical torture that Aiton endured, Graham Phillips supplied psychological torture. And Graham Phillips is a war criminal, in my judgment, and he should be tried. So but Russia needs to to do exactly what modern Germany did after the Nazis, saying we're sorry and we're going to pay good money to Ukraine to help repair the damage. And they're going to cooperate with the trials, but the trial should happen in yeah. The Hague. By the way, <laughs> MH17, hmm. the Russians really, really shouldn't have done what they did to those Dutch people because the Dutch is one of the greatest democracies in the world and they have a long memory and they're very effective. And so who's leading the charge to get the Ukrainians the F-16s? The Dutch. I mean, the British are I, th I don't know, the British have been good during this war. I think it's because of the Second World War. We understand it. We understand what it's like. Um, but the Dutch are really, really good. And they're going to, I hope the plan will be that they will host these war crimes in The Hague. And the Russians will also have to pay, just in, uh, uh, pay a proper price and a proper trial for MH17. For me, that was the moment when we should have sanctioned Russia, when we should have cut Russia off. After, the, after MH17, we should have cut Russia out of the international banking system. But they sold too much gas and oil to Germany, and they parked too much of their dark money in London, in London grad. Shame on us for letting this happen. Shame on everybody for not standing up to Vladimir Putin earlier. What's great about Ukraine is you are fighting Russian fascism. No one else dead. You have no choice because if Russian fascism wins, there is no Ukraine. They, their plan is genocide and they will have succeeded. But they're failing badly. I'm an optimist. Uh, the last question, when there will be Ukrainian premier, as you told uh, of the Eastern Front of your documentary? 
So the Eastern Front, the, the, the world premiere uh, is happening in Kiev, quite right too. Um, Russian bombs, fuck off. Um, and um, it's happening on June the 7th, which is actually my birthday, um, at the Cinema House at 6.30. So um, uh, we'll sell some tickets. We're going to be inviting some people, some ambassadors, stuff like this. Um, but um, it'll be cool. And um, I want as many Ukrainians as possible to watch it and as many Ukrainians to tell their British and American and German friends to watch it too. On June the 14th, there's going to be a premiere in London, in Leicester Square, where the James Bond movies have their premieres. Cool. And then there's going to be a premiere in LA as well. Mm. We, um, um, we're serious about getting this film out to as many people as possible. And I, I'm sorry about the bad language, I apologize, but um, I, I always end my Twitter war diaries with the following phrase, I'm gonna do it now, Vladimir Putin, we have a simple message to you, do fuck off. Thank you, thank you for your work and Thank you for the interview and good premiere.